All right, so welcome back, everybody. Uh, as you are aware, we are moving on to the back of the book now, actually, to look at the logic sections. And uh, even though we're jumping all the way to the back, I'm even going to take those out of order. We're going to do uh, Chapter 19 on Categorical Logic first this week, and then we'll move back to Chapter 18 on the Sentential or Propositional Logic for next week. Uh, the reason for that, very simply, is timing. Uh, the categorical logic was the first form of logic that was created by Aristotle about 2,300 years ago, whereas the uh, sentential or propositional logic uh, is a much more recent invention. So I just like to take them in their historical order. Well, as I said, categorical logic is a form of logic, the very first form, that was created about 2,300 years ago by the philosopher Aristotle. And uh, the reason why this is referred to as categorical logic is because in this form of logic, all of the major, uh, all of the statements that we use have to fit one of four types of sentences. And I have these on the board here for you. And as an example, we have all A are B, no A are B, some A are B, and some A are not B. Now, of course, A and B are just placeholders for your uh, subject and predicate. So this could be all cats are feline, uh, no dogs are elephants, uh, some, uh, some elephants are gray, some pigs are not orange, you know, whatever you wanted to fill in with that. Uh, so A and B are just your placeholders. But essentially... The first two, because it's all of them or none of them, it's all inclusive or all exclusive, those are referred to as universal claims. And of course the first one, because it's all of them are, the entire group is, that would be referred to as a universal affirmative, whereas none of them are, no A's are B's, uh, is denying, so it would be a universal negative. Okay. When we look at the some are and some are not, we're not dealing with the entirety of a group, but only with part of a group. So when you see some in categorical logic, you should think there is at least one. There exists at least one. So some A or B, there's at least one A that is a B. Some elephants are gray. There's at least one elephant that is gray. Okay. So it is a particular statement, and again, in this case, it's making an affirmative claim, whereas the last one, some may or not be, is making a negative claim. So your four categories of sentences are universal affirmative, universal negative, particular affirmative, and particular negative. Okay, so that is... Um, those are the four types of sentences that we can use and the only four types that we can use in categorical logic. Now, if we break this down a little bit, the all, the sum, and the no, those are referred to as quantifiers. They basically tell you what it is that the subject ranges over, the quantifiers. The are and the are not, that is referred to as the copula. Okay. The copula is the connecting verb. Now it is the quantifiers and the, the quantifier and the copula, those are the important things in this form of logic, and so these are referred to as logical terms. Okay, so the quantifier and the copula, those are your logical terms. The reason being is that altering them, changing from an all to a no or from a no to a some are, it's going to have a bearing upon the value of your statement. And the same thing of changing from an, all, from an R to an R not would have that value. So altering the quantifier or the copula would affect the logic of your statement as well as of your uh, argument. Now, as I said before, the A and the B, the A is your, is your uh, subject, rather, and the B is the placeholder for your predicate. The subject and predicate, those are non, 
logical terms. Okay, so the subject and the predicate are non-logical terms. Changing them may change the truth value of your statement, but it's not going to alter or affect the logic in any way. Uh, remember last week when we talked about how you could have the, the statement about all cats are feline and the statement about all cats are dogs, and even though we would say the one statement is true, the other is false, within the context of an argument, the structure is identical, and that's what logic is concerned with, is the structure of the argument. So, um, in other words, then, what we are concerned primarily with is not so much the subject or the predicate, which is why in this form of logic, most of the time, you're going to see A's and B's and X's and Y's rather than actual words, uh, because in many cases, the words may not be considered to matter. What matters are the... Uh, quantifier and the copula, the structure, the form. Um, but every uh, statement in categorical logic is going to fit that particular pattern written in that way, quantifier, subject, copula, predicate. Um, and again, your four major categories, universal affirmative, universal negative, particular affirmative, particular negative. Now, there is another thing we need to look at here. And this is what's going to be referred to as the mood. The mood is simply a sentence letter that is given to, us, uh, to, to be assigned to each statement. And essentially, these are just the vowels. So, every universal affirmative statement is referred to as an A, an A statement. Every universal negative is referred to as an E statement. Every particular affirmative is referred to as an I statement, and every particular negative is referred to as an O statement. Okay, so A, E, I, O. You know your vowels, you're in good shape. And what this does is it makes a very nice shorthand for us so that we don't always have to write out big long statements. Uh, we can just rely upon the mood because anybody who knows logic knows that this is what an A statement is, this is what an E statement is, and so on. It's also going to be useful because I'm going to show you a technique in a little bit where you can determine whether an argument is valid or invalid based upon the concept of the mood. Okay. Now a lot of what I'm going to show you uh, in this lecture is not actually in your book. Your book wants to teach you to do this form of logic using Venn diagrams. Venn diagrams are evil. Uh, they were created in the they were created in the 19th century by John Venn, and his intention was to make logic a little bit easier for people by helping them to visualize certain things. But most people who have been introduced to it have found it a lot more hard, uh, a lot more difficult to work with than it should be. Um, they've seen a lot of problems with it. And as a result of that, I just simply recognize, as do a lot of people now, that it's not worth the effort to, uh, to try to teach the uh, Venn diagram method when there are other, much simpler ways of testing validity. Um, part of the reason I think why this particular book gave you the Venn diagram method was because he didn't want to go into the details that I'm going to give you here. But I personally, I think, and hopefully you'll find too, that this is actually a lot easier of a method. So anyway, that's the first thing we need to be concerned with, is just knowing the statements themselves. Uh, again, just to re recap here, a universal affirmative is an A statement. A universal negative is an E statement. A particular for affirmative is an I statement. And a particular negative is an O statement. So now that we are familiar with the statements themselves, we can take a look at the argument form that's going to be used. Now the argument that's used here is called a categorical syllogism. Okay. Categorical syllogism. And it has a very specific form associated with it. A categorical syllogism is going to be made up of three statements. 
there's always three statements, two premises, one conclusion. Okay, so three statements, two premises, one conclusion. Um, they are all of the AEIO type. Okay, so they're all categorical statements, uh, like we saw on the previous screen. And each statement, or each uh, syllogism, is going to have three terms, each used twice. Okay. So we'll give you this argument that you're already familiar with. All cats are feline, all leopards are cats, therefore all leopards are feline. So you already are familiar with that statement a little bit, or that uh, argument rather, anyway. Uh, you didn't, we looked at it last week, we just didn't call it a categorical syllogism, but that's what it is. So you can see that there are three statements here. There are two premise statements, one conclusion statement. In this case, they're all A statements, right? all the universal affirmative, but they could be a combination of A, E, I, or O. Uh, and when we look at the terms, the subject and predicate terms, you'll find that there are three terms, each one used twice. So here's cats used twice, there's feline used twice, there's leopards used twice. So this gives you a prime example of what a categorical syllogism uh, is. Now, one of the first things that we need to know if we're going to uh, test the validity, well, I guess we should look at terminology a little bit here first, shouldn't we? Uh, when we look at these statements, we should note that the first premise of a syllogism is called the major premise. The second is called the minor premise. And then, of course, the conclusion, which you're familiar with. So the first is the major premise. The second is the minor premise. Now, when we look at the three terms, each used twice, you will find that always there is one term that is used twice in the premises, but not in the conclusion. So in this case, you'll see the word cats is used twice in the premises, but it's not found at all in the conclusion. Well, this is referred to as your middle term. Okay. The middle term is very important because it's what links the two premises together and allows you to draw the conclusion. And the placement of that middle term is also going to have a lot to do with whether or not your argument ends up being valid or not. So that's something we'll see in a moment. But the middle term is going to be the one that's used twice in the premises, but not at all in the conclusion. So the middle term, used twice in the premises, never in the conclusion, just like this. All right. Now, once you have found what the middle term is, and you always have to find the middle term first to know the others, uh, once you've found the middle term, then the term that's left in the major premise, in this case the word feline, is going to be referred to as your major term, simply because it's in the major premise and isn't the middle. The major term is always going to be also the predicate of your conclusion. Okay. So the major term is in major premise. 
and the predicate of your conclusion. And the term that's left over after you found the middle term in the minor premise, in this case leopards, is going to be referred to as the minor term. The minor term, in addition to being in the minor premise, is also always going to be the subject. Okay. It's always going to be the subject of the conclusion. So again, the minor term is in the minor premise, and it's the subject of the conclusion. Okay. And so that form is one that you have to always keep in mind, um, particularly when you're constructing or creating these syllogisms. So again, the middle term found in the premises only, not in the conclusion. The term after you found the middle term, the one that's left over in the major premise is the major term, which is also always the predicate of the conclusion. And after you found the middle term, the one that's left over in the minor premise is always the minor term, and that's always the subject of the conclusion. Okay. So we have to keep that, uh, keep that in mind. All right. Uh, incidentally, if you haven't found it already, there is a little cheat sheet uh, that I have posted on Blackboard for you. Uh, so you should make reference to that. It has all of this, all of this stuff kind of written out for you. But uh, hopefully, by my going through it here, you'll understand a little bit better what it is that we're dealing with. All right, so we've seen what a syllogism is going to look like. We've seen the mood, the A, E, I, and O statements. The next thing we have to talk about is called the figure. The figure has to do with the placement of the middle term. There are four possibilities. So we have what are called four figures. So the first figure is going to look something like this. Okay. So notice again, here you have a syllogism. You have three statements, two premise statements, one conclusion. In this case, the middle term the one that's used twice in the premises, but not in the conclusion, is M. And for all these examples, I'm just using M for middle term because it's easier to remember. Um, which means that if that's the middle term, then A has to be the major term, which is also in the predicate of the conclusion. B has to be the minor term, which is also the subject of the conclusion. All right, so the point is, though, that to be a first figure, the middle term has to be in the subject of the major in the predicate of the minor. So any time that the uh, middle term is in that configuration, that's referred to as a first figure syllogism. Okay, so if the middle term is in the major, uh, the subject of the major premise, and the predicate of the minor premise, that's first figure. So here's another syllogism. And uh, again, what we have to look at is the middle term, the middle term, the one that's used twice in the premises, not at all in the conclusion. And you'll find that it's in the predicate position for both. Okay. So any time that you find the middle term in the predicate spot for both,
that's going to be second figure. Okay, so that configuration is always called second figure. So here's another one for you. No MRA, all MRB, therefore no BRA. Our middle term, the M, is found this time in the subject position of both syllogism, of uh, both uh, statements rather. So anytime that you find the middle term in the subject position of both premises, that's third figure. So that configuration is always third. And finally, all A R M, some M or B, therefore some B R A. This is your fourth figure which is basically the opposite of first figure, right? In first figure, the middle term was in the subject of the major, the predicate of the minor. Here in the fourth figure, your middle term is in the predicate of the major and the subject of the minor. So the predicate of the major, the subject of the minor, that is your fourth figure. So you want to just pay attention when you're figuring out the figure of your syllogism where that middle term is going to be placed. Okay. So in order to use the um, coined word method, which is the test that I'm going to give you the easier, uh, the easiest of all of the, the tests that we have for testing uh, validity. Um, what we have to do is to name the syllogism. And to name the syllogism, basically what you need are two things. You need the mood and you need the figure. That's how you name a syllogism. The mood, as you've seen, are the, the uh, sentence letters, the A, E, I, and O, that refer to the statements. And they are, <clears throat> excuse me, they are always going to be given in the form of major, minor, conclusion. You can't jumble them up. It's always major, minor, conclusion. And then the figure, of course, the placement of the middle term. So, if I wanted to give the mood and figure, basically to name the uh, syllogisms that are on the board, I would find first the mood, okay, all MRA, all BRM, therefore all BRA. The first premise is all R, that's an A. The next one, all R, that's an A. And the conclusion, all R, that's an A. So the mood is AAA. And the middle term is in the subject of the major, the predicate of the minor. That makes it a figure one. So this would be referred to as an AAA figure one syllogism. The second one, we have all R, that's an A, no R, that's an E, no R, that's an E. So the mood, A, E, E, and the middle term is in the predicate of both, so that's a second figure, A, E, E, figure two. Let's look at the third one. We have no R, that's an E, all R, that's an A, and no R, that's an E. So the mood, E-A-E. -E. The middle term is in the subject position of both, which makes it a third figure. Okay. So E-A-E, -E, figure three. And the last one here, we've got all R, that's an A. Some R, that's an I. Some R, that's an I. So the mood is A-I-I. -I. 
The middle term is in the predicate of the major, the subject of the minor. That makes it a figure four. Okay. So it's actually pretty easy um, when, once you get the hang of it. And, you know, like I said, if you take that uh, cheat sheet that I gave you, it's got all this right in front of you. So you can uh, look at it, and, and uh, right there you've got what the A-E-I-N-O are. You've got what the four figures are. So it's just a matter of, of working them out. So let me uh, put just a couple. We're just slipping here. Okay. Okay, so let me just put a couple uh, syllogisms up here on the screen for you. So here's three syllogisms that we've put on the board here. The first one is all A are B, no B are C, therefore no C are A. So if I wanted to name this syllogism, the first thing I'd have to do is to look at the mood. So the major premise is all R, that's an A, no R, that's an E, no R, again, that's an E. Then I need to find the middle term. The term that's used twice in the premises is not in the conclusion. In this case, it's the letter B. And we can see that that middle term, that letter B, is found in the predicate of the major premise, the subject of the minor premise, so that's a figure four. Okay, A-E-E -E, figure four, and that's that syllogism. The next one, <clears throat> no DRF. Some C are F, therefore some C are not D. So again, to uh, do the mood, we've got no R, that's an E statement. Some R, that's an I statement. And some are not, that's an O statement. The middle term in this case, the one used twice in the premises, not in the conclusion, is F. So, it's in the predicate position for both which makes it a figure two. So this would be an EIO figure two. And the last one, some P are not Q. All P are N, therefore some N are Q. So we've got some R, that's an I statement. All R, that's an A. Some R, that's an I. So I, A, I. The middle term in this case is the P, used twice in the premises, not in the conclusion. And that P is in the subject position of both premises. That makes it a figure three. So this would be an IAI figure three. Now, I will show you very shortly how to use the coined word list to determine whether such arguments are valid or invalid simply based upon the mood and the figure. In fact, actually, why don't I go ahead and do that now? On that cheat sheet, you will find a list. Let me put it up here. I know you can't see it well here, but just so you know what you're looking for. Uh, you will see that there is a list of names. They are divided based upon figures. So you have first figure, second figure, third figure, and fourth figure. And there's a list of words or names underneath of each one. 
So under first figure, you see Barbara, Kellerent, Darii, and Ferio. Under second figure, you see Cesare, Camestris, Festino, Barocco. Under third figure, you see Dissimus, Datizi, Bocardo, and Ferrison. And under the fourth figure, you see Camines, Dimaris, and Fresison. Now, this coin word list was created by an individual um, called Peter of Spain. in the 14th century. Peter of Spain actually went on to become one of the Pope John's, I forget what number, 21, 22, somewhere in that area. But uh, he was also a very, very prominent logician uh, during his uh, early life as well. And what Peter recognized was that there were four moods and there were four um, figures. And that meant that there were 64 possible combinations that you could create. Uh, so there are basically 64 different syllogism forms that you could make from the four moods and four figures. So he sat down and wrote out all 64 of those possibilities. He used a series of rules which Aristotle had taught, and he used those to determine validity. What he found were that 15 of those syllogisms were valid and all of the rest were invalid. What he did was then to, um, he created what really was originally a little Latin poem because in the Middle Ages, of course, paper was very expensive and hard to come by and so people didn't have their own books. They couldn't really take notes. They had to commit everything to memory. And uh, it's a lot easier to remember a poem or a song than it is just a list of random num uh, figures or uh, numbers or, or names even. Uh, so he put this into a nice little poem. We don't have to remember things in that way because paper is dirt cheap for us. And so what do we do? Well, we just simply have this nice little list in front of us and it's gonna serve the same purpose for us that it did for Peter and his students all those years back. Um, essentially, when you look at the list, you'll see again that there are four different columns representing the four figures, for second, third, third, and fourth figure. And under each, there's either three or four words or names. In each of those names, there are three and only three vowels. And none of those vowels are U, which means they're all A, E, I, and O. And so, if you take first figure, for example, you'll see there's Barbara, there's Kellerant, there's Darii, and there is uh, Ferio. So when we look at each of these, we see that there are three vowels within it. In Barbara, you have A, A, A. Well, what this shows us is that when Peter went through, you know, there's 15 names here. Uh, these are, if, if it's on this list, it's a valid form. And so if you have an A, A, A figure one, it's valid. And you would simply say valid via Barbara. Okay, you give the name on the list and that's your proof that it's valid without doing any other work because anybody that knows logic knows that Peter already did all the work for you. And all you have to do is make reference to his material. Uh, Kellerant, E, A, E. So if you have an E, A, E figure one, that's also valid. Darii, A, I, I. So an AII figure one would be valid. Ferio, E-I-O. So an E-I-O figure one would be valid. All right. Any other figure one syllogism is going to be invalid. Those are the only four figure one syllogisms that are valid. 
And keep in mind, too, that the order has to be specifically the first vowel is the major premise, the second vowel is the minor premise, the third vowel is the conclusion. There can't be any variation upon that. You can't jumble them up, okay? But that's really all there is to this very easy coined word test. Um, and so, if I were to look at the statements that I have here, we found that this syllogism is an AEE -E figure four, and I want to know, is that valid or not? Well, because it's a figure four, I'm going to look under the figure four column, and I'm going to try to find a word that has these vowels in that order, AEE. -E. And in fact, the first one up there, Kamenes, has that. And so I know that this is valid, and so I'm just going to list it as valid via Kamenes. Right? See again, A, E, E, under the fourth figure column, it's on the list, therefore it's valid. The second one over here, E, I, O, figure two. So I'm going to look under the figure two, second figure column, try to find a word that has these vowels in that order, E, I, O. And the third one down on the list has it, Festino, E, I, O. So I know because it's on the list that it's valid, and I would say valid via Festino. And again, E, I, O, under the figure two column. And here, I, A, I, figure three. I'm gonna look under the third figure column for a letter that, or for a word that has I, A, I under it. And the first one again, Dissimus has that. So again, since it's on the list, it's valid via Dissimus I, A, I under figure three. Okay, so that's really all there is to it. It's the easiest test in the world. Um, but that's how we determine, or that's the easiest way anyway, to determine. Now, Aristotle gave us the rules list uh, whereby essentially you had to meet all five of the rules in order to determine that it's valid. If it violated one of the rules, it was invalid. But, I mean, that's what Peter already did that work for you, so we just make use of what he's done, and it makes things a whole lot easier. Uh, and I will show you a Venn diagram later, just so you can see how obnoxiously evil they are. Um, but you don't have to worry about doing those. Just use the coin word method, and you'll be fine. Um, actually, it's pretty interesting, too, because Every one of the letters that Peter has in these words has value. It has a purpose or a meaning. And if you know how to read them, it allows you to reduce these words down. Now, this doesn't have any value to us anymore, because to us, we're just concerned with the bottom line. What we want to know is, is it valid or is it invalid? But for some reason, the people in the Middle Ages believed that the higher up you were on the list, the more ideal the argument form was. And likewise, the closer you were to first figure, the more ideal it was. And so he gave you a way of reducing these things down if you know how to read it. You would start with the first letter. So for example, let's say you have the fourth figure Demaris, I-A-I figure four. Well, if you know how to read the M, the R, and the S and what those stand for, they will tell you certain maneuvers that you can do to reduce this down to Datizi, which is the A-I-I figure three. And then the T and the S will tell you what to do in order to reduce it down to Dissimus, I-A-I figure three. And then those letters, the S uh, and the M and the other S, will tell you what to do to reduce it down to the first figure, Darii, A-I-I, figure one. It's really amazing how he made every one of these letters stand for something, uh, how he worked all of this stuff out. It's completely irrelevant to our modern world, but it's really, really fascinating how he was able to do all of this. So as I've always been very impressed with that, uh, even though, again, I don't see the point to it. I mean, to him, Barbara is the most perfect syllogism, the AAA figure one. 
but again, to us, valid is valid, and that's all we really care about. You know, so I mean, we don't worry about uh, reducing things down from one form to another. But anyway, that's the that's the way that the coin word uh, method works for testing validity. So if it's on the list, you simply say valid via and then give the word, and that proves that it's valid. And if you don't see it on the list, then of course it's invalid. All right. One other thing to uh, <clears throat> show you here about this. We've seen how to take a syllogism that's given to us and name it. Uh, another thing we may want to know how to do is how to create the syllogism from the mood and figure. And that's pretty easy. Uh, we'll just create... Um, A mood and a figure. How about EAO figure four? Well, basically, you've got your um, configuration right there. Uh, you know that the major premise is going to be an E statement. So we start off there. No something or something. Leave your subject and predicate blank for the moment. Your minor premise is an A statement. So you know that's all something or something. And then our conclusion is an O statement, which would be some, something, or not, something else. Okay. Now, it's a figure four, so you know that figure four, your middle term, has to go in the predicate of the major and the subject of the minor. And when I'm working them out like this, I always just use M for my middle term, and that, you know, M stands for middle term. It makes sense. Once we've got that in place, we can simply fill in with other letters for the, uh, so for the uh, major premise and the minor premise. Again, I usually use A for the major and B for the minor. And then we have to fill in the conclusion. Well, remember again that the minor premise is always the subject of your conclusion. The major premise is always the predicate of your conclusion. And so right there, we have written out for us an EAO figure four syllogism. No A or M, all M or B, therefore some B are not A. Okay. So that's, it's really a very simple process. You're just plugging things in in their appropriate position. Let's take one more. Uh, just by way of example, how about AIA figure 3? AIA 3. All right, well, again, our major premise is the A, so that's all R. The minor premise is an I, so that's some R. And the conclusion is an A, which is all R. The middle term, it's a figure three. So with a figure three, your middle term goes in the subject position of both. So we'll fill in the M for middle term. I'm going to use A for the major term, B for the minor term. Again, the minor term is always the subject of your um, conclusion. And the major term is always the predicate of your conclusion. So we have all MRA, some MRB, therefore all BRA. If um, you use the A, B, and M like I do on these, it actually makes it pretty easy for you because your conclusion is always going to be B, A. So uh, it'll make it a little bit easier. And also when we go to check some of these on uh, Thursday, you'll have the opportunity to uh, kind of make sure that it matches if you use other letters. You know, you can kind of see the formulation, but you won't um, you won't necessarily see it like exactly the way that mine will because I'm doing it, you know, with the A, B, and the M. So it's a good idea just to, to try it that way, okay? But anyway, that's how if you were given the, the uh, mood and figure and told to write out the syllogism, that's how you would do it. You just start by laying out the mood and then plugging in the middle term, and once you do, the other two pieces fall into place. So that's all there is to that.
Um, incidentally, if we wanted to test these uh, for validity, we would find EAO figure four. If you look under figure four, there is no word that has EAO in it. So because it's not on the list, we know that this one's invalid. And over here we have AIA3. Um, under third figure, AI, AIA, nope, it's not on the list either. Right. So both of those that I made up are invalid simply because there's not a word on the list that has those basic forms. Okay. So that's pretty much what you need to know. I did promise to do a uh, Venn diagram for you just so I can show you how evil these things are and why it is you're probably going to be happy not to have to do them. So I'll just steal this one that's already up here on the, on the board. Uh, a Venn diagram is a picture of the individual statements. So all ARB, you would have one circle here that represents the subject term. You would have another sub, uh, circle here that represents the predicate term. Now when you look at these, you'll see that there is a section here that's A by itself. There's a section over here that's B by itself. But there's a section here in the middle where A and B overlap. Okay. Now when we say that all A's are B's, that means that there are no A's that exist by themselves, that every A is also a B. And so you would shade in this part of that circle. And shading it in, it's kind of like making it disappear. It's like erasing it. So now any A that exists has to be right here inside of the B circle. No ARB. Again, you'd have your A circle for the uh, subject, your B circle for the predicate. But this time we're saying that not a single A is a B. There's no uh, overlap with any of them. And so A's are just A's, B's are just B's. And so you would fill in basically to erase that center section so nothing can exist there. So there are, there's nothing that can live in that area that's both an A and a B. There's just A's, there's just B's. With the particulars, some A or B, again, here's your circle for the A. Here's your circle for the B. And this time, instead of shading, remember that when you see some it means there's at least one. So we're going to use an X to represent that idea of there being one. So there's at least one A that is a B. You would have an X inside of that center section there to show that there's at least one thing that is both an A and a B. You could still have just A's, you could still have just B's, but there's at least one thing that is both an A and a B. And finally, some A or not B. There's your circle for the A. There's your circle for the B. So now there's at least one A that is not a B. So that means you would have an X inside the A, the a circle, but outside of the B circle. So that there is at least one thing that is just an A and not a B. There could be other things that are both, but there's at least one thing that is not. So those are your four Venn diagrams that you would use. Now, when you're dealing, of course, with a uh, argument as opposed to a sentence, you have three terms rather than uh, two. So here's what you've got to do. No A R M. So we're going to diagram that first premise. So this circle represents the A, this circle represents the M. Not a single A is an M. So we're going to fill in that section where they overlap so that nothing can exist there. There's just A's, there's just M's, but there's no A's that are M's. 
Okay, so we're using that E statement. But now we have the second premise, which says all M's are B's. So now we need a third symbol, or a third circle, rather. So see how here it kind of looks like a MasterCard logo. Now you're going to add in this third circle and make it look more like Mickey Mouse um, with, with the ears sticking out there. And uh, so this is your, your B circle. The second premise there says all M are B. So every M that exists has got to be inside the B circle. So looking, forgetting about the A for a moment, looking just at the M and the B, we have to uh, shade in the part of the M circle that is outside of the B so that nothing can exist there. Okay. And so we have just diagrammed the premises. Remember, as you learned last week, that when you um, have a, a, a deductive argument, the conclusion should already be contained within the premises. So I want to look and see if that's the case. Well, some B are not A. There has to be an X inside of the B circle, but outside of the A circle. So somewhere in this area, there needs to be an X. But that's not, we don't have that, right? Because neither of the premises placed an X. So when we diagram the premises, the conclusion was not pictured. And that's why it's invalid. Okay. Um, and that, that's basically the idea. That's basically the way the Venn diagram system works. Let me show you one that is valid. So you can kind of get a glimpse of that. Okay, so here's an AAA figure one, which we know is valid via Barbara. Uh, but if we wanted to do a Venn diagram of it, all M are A. So there's the M circle, there's the A circle. So every M is an A. I'm going to shade in the part of the M circle that's outside of the A circle. And then all B are M, so we need to add in the B circle. So all B are M, so we have to fill in the entirety of the B circle that is outside of the M circle so that nothing can exist there. And so now we've diagrammed the two premises. We want to look and see if the conclusion is pictured. Well, the conclusion is that all B are A, so I want to look at the part right here, which is the B part outside of the A part. And for this to show, it would have to have all of that filled in, which it is. You can see that because of what we did with the premises, that this is all completely filled in, and therefore we know that since the Conclusion is pictured by diagramming the premises. We know that it's valid using the Venn diagram method. Okay, so again, just because it's in the book, I showed that to you so you can see how the Venn diagrams work. But I think you will agree that it's a lot easier just to check the coin word list and say, hey, AAA figure one, that's valid via Barbara, uh, than it is to have to go through all of that mess. All right. So that's why I'm going to leave it with that, and as far as the exam is going to be concerned, you will not be responsible for uh, anything about the Venn diagrams. Um, you will need to know how to use the coin word test, though. All right. Now, because of that, the book is not going to be much good for you. So for this week, and probably this week only of the entire term, uh, the homework is going to be a separate sheet of paper uh, that I will post for you. So I will, I will um, have that up uh, on Blackboard 
under content, it'll say homework uh, chapter 19, I think it is. And um, it'll be an actual uh, homework that's given to you from me. And basically what it's going to do is it's going to give you the opportunity to practice creating a few syllogisms and naming the syllogisms and using the coin word test. So basically just to become familiar with the things that uh, you will need to know for, um, for, the, uh, for the exam when we get around to that point. Okay. So that basically is all that I have to tell you with regards to categorical logic. And I think we'll leave it at that. Uh, like usual, if you have any specific questions, feel free to email me. Otherwise, be sure to tune in uh, on Collaborate at uh, uh, 11 o'clock on Thursday, and we'll go through the homework. I'll answer any specific questions that you have at that point. So good luck. Have fun.